The list is long, the list is impressive, and uh, the list we believe will be growing in 2024. We're talking tight end you, and of course, what the Hawkeyes have to offer at that position coming up this fall. Talking Hawkeyes, of course, every Tuesday with you, 4.30 Central Time, edition 136 with Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm, your destination for Hawkeyes athletics, men's and women's basketball, and of course, football just about every day. Corey, how you doing today? Doing good, doing good Mark. I, I apologize for the vibration there from my phone. That was YouTube notifying me that you are live. So um, be sure people need to make sure they have the bell turned on for notifications on all your channels and my channel as well, I hope. But uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be talking about uh, football. I know the combines in our rear view mirror. We're still previewing positions as we get very close now to the start of spring practice. And I know Hawkeye Nation is buzzing about Iowa men's basketball now working their way into a potential bubble bursting uh, spot. They, they've burst onto the scene here in, in late February, early March with an opportunity to maybe surprise some people and get into the field of 68. And of course, the women are in fine position as they head up to Minneapolis for the Big Ten Championship. In Minneapolis, what kind of uh, a track is that for you? How long would it take you to travel up to Minneapolis? No, I, well, first of all, I don't have plans to be up in Minneapolis for this game, but it's not a long drive whatsoever. I think it's from Ames. It's like two and a half hours. Oh, it's I mean, it's straight up 35. So believe me, it's so this Big Ten tournament is sold out and it's been sold out for a while now. And I would guess that at least 50 to 60 percent of those fans are Hawkeyes. And when you think about that, you know, comparative to 14 different institutions in this conference that are competing at that tournament, that's pretty impressive. Now, we'll see. Um, I, I One of the things I talked about, and I'll be releasing a podcast actually this evening uh, with my predictions for the Big Ten Women's Basketball Tournament uh, with my filled out Big Ten bracket. One thing I'll be looking for, Mark, is, you know, be, whenever you have a, a, an event like this where you have, you know, kind of like Iowa State when they have competed in the Big, T Big 12 tournament down in Kansas City, call that Hilton South because – it isn't a long drive down to Kansas City, straight down on I-35 for Iowa State fans. And you just wonder, like, when you assume that you're going to have a majority from one institution, what happens during those other games? Like, how much is the crowd a factor in Ohio State versus Illinois? Because you may think, oh, neutral atmosphere, right? Illinois fans aren't going to travel for the most part, even though Ohio State's really good. They're not going to get a huge crowd for women's basketball up in Minneapolis. But there's going to be Iowa fans at those sessions. And you know that those Iowa fans will be rooting for the underdog. And the crowd is a factor in those tournament games, whether you're talking about the NCAA tournament or the conference tournament. So this is a fun time of year. You know, you've got the mid-majors that are competing on the men's side this week, and we'll get men's conference tournaments next week. And then we'll have selection Sunday, and then the NCAA starting in a couple of weeks. So fun time of year, and then we'll hop into spring football. Yeah, it's certainly impressive for the Iowa uh, basketball support on the women's side. Uh, absolutely. I don't know what it says for the rest of the Big Ten <laughs> to, to, to be outnumbered uh, basically one-to-one -one or 60-40 by one team uh, well, that's, as opposed to 13. Keep in mind, that's my conjecture. I don't know. I can't. I'm just kind of estimating there. But that that's, I mean, honestly, that's my guess. And you're also guessing and estimating based on the proximity. If it was being held in Detroit or Columbus or Happy Valley, you may not have the same projection yeah uh, i will say this though the big 10 tournament traditionally has been in indianapolis or chicago and both of those are not bad drives for iowa fans especially chicago chicago is even shorter of a drive for people from iowa city uh indianapolis you know is a little bit further but not a terrible drive either so iowa fans travel well in support of this team and um you know I i'm i'm blown away by some of the support that we've seen from the outside of the hawkeye fan base for Caitlin Clark and this team, um, they've captivated the attention of a lot of people. And uh, I'll just give you a quick example of this, Mark. Yesterday, I published all it was was a uh, you know five to six minute update on I was starting point guard Molly Davis, who went down with a scary injury on Sunday. And uh, this was a pr from a press release. I was sent in a press release about Molly Davis's availability, and he, she is projected to be back in the lineup for the NCAA tournament. So she'll miss the big 10 tournament. We'll be back the following or two weeks because they'll get a bye week Thankful for her. 
that video posted less than 24 hours ago has already got 40,000 views. You know, it's amazing. And, and you know that a lot of those are Hawkeye fans. And you, I, I'm grateful for all the Hawkeye fans that that rely on the channel or head over the channel to, to look for news and updates. But it's amazing reading through some of the comments of non-Iowa fans who have taken an interest in the sport because of this Iowa team. I just think it's cool. There was a guy that called in Sunday during our postgame show who, uh, who was actually an Ohio State fan. But he even admitted on the show, he's like, I'm rooting for Iowa today. You know, I'm just that's just how I I just I love that what I was bringing to the environment of, of women's college hoops and just the attention it's garnishing. So it's a fun time. And uh, I think they got a good chance of going up there and winning this week. Um, it'll be hard without their starting point guard, without having another ball handler. But um, it'll be a nice test for them. Yeah, I guess I've got to admit at this point, I would know who Caitlin Clark was, even if you didn't told me. Tell me, I, I think that probably would have come across my radar at, at this point. Being on Twitter, I'm sure it would. I don't know that it would have been otherwise, though, because I don't know where I would have come across it elsewhere. But on Twitter, yes, I, I see her mention on Twitter. But you will forever be the person that told me who Caitlin Clark was. Well, I have. I, I had to do, we'll say this, Mark. I have a hard time. Like you don't. You must not watch a ton of ESPN or major sports networks in general not, not during uh the off season i okay. don't anymore yeah. i used to yeah i don't either really but um yeah th this has been it's been uh, I've, it's amazing i get text messages every once in a while some, from some family out in california where they'll be like hey i keep hearing about this caitlin clark on the, the national news or whatever so it, it, it's cool it's cool exposure not just for the state but for the sport and for um you know a, a I want to call her a small town girl. She's from Des Moines, but she's a Midwest girl who grew up wanting to be a Hawkeye and has been here four years and she is going to be moving on. That announcement did come back last week, Mark, that she's going to be uh, headed to the WNBA draft after this. So she'll be looking to change a sport that drastically needs help as it relates to viewership and fandom. I know uh, it sounds like the Indiana fever have already had just a, a ridiculous onslaught of, um, season ticket sales. So it's, she's going to help that team without question, but as a whole, she'll, what she's looking to do is grow the sport and more power to her. I think it's a great story. And by the way, we had to, I was at the game on Sunday. We had Travis Scott rapper, Travis Scott, who's got to be considered. I know you're not a rap fan. I'm not saying I, I have am no here, idea who that is. Okay. He's a really, really popular big time rapper in, in the hip hop world. And uh, Nolan Ryan and his family were all there. Okay, I know who that is. I, I can tell you a lot about Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan had a, a think I think he I heard something about him buying five tickets and he spent like thirty thousand dollars, something insane on these tickets. I didn't see him at the game. They didn't talk to him, but they did introduce Travis Scott. And you know, a lot of recruits. Good day for Iowa athletics as far as exposure is concerned. Um, they had the one guy that I, I can't get over them treating like a celebrity is the Jake from state farm guy, the actor that does the commercials. But anyways, he was there uh, shooting t-shirts into the crowd. And uh, anyways, cool. You know what I think is the best about it all, Mark is you go to these games and you see these little kids, you hear these little kids that are so invested in the sport. And not that there aren't, I mean, I was young and invested in men's basketball, but there's a lot of kids that I know have taken to Caitlin Clark, both boys and girls. And, have really gotten involved. The example I brought up during the post game show on Sunday, I heard this little, I think it was a little girl behind us somewhere and the official didn't call a travel or something. And you've got these adults yelling, you know, typical at a game. And then I hear this little girl yell, get glasses. <laughs> and I just thought it was hilarious. I'm like, we already got like five-year-olds ripping on their, the officials, but you know, it's, it's, it just it made made me feel good to be able to be in that environment for a women's basketball game. They used to have curtains, you know, around the stands to make it look better on TV because you only had a, a few thousand fans showing up to these games. And and, you know, they sold out every game this year. They'll be sold out for the tournament. They get two games at home for the NCAA tournament, assuming they win game one and good times. Yeah, I've been buffered from all this. None of my circle of friends or family. um, talk about women's basketball at all so do they talk about men's basketball uh yeah well a couple of my friends do yeah yeah i have friends that uh traditionally like men's basketball men's college basketball well i'll tell you uh the men have played themselves into consideration well they got a huge game sunday 
at home against Illinois. Senior day for them. If they win that, it's a, a quad one victory, um, which I'm sure you don't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, I I know what the term is. I could give it a pretty good shot. I know that they've. This is a relatively new thing in the last ten or fifteen years that they yep. split the teams up into quads as opposed to rankings and so forth. But yeah, stuff that I used to follow. But but I did mention to, to give Caitlin Clark and Iowa basketball their due. I did mention to you a couple of weeks ago, I was hanging out with some friends over the weekend and in amongst them wanting to watch the NBA, a men's game, they would flip to the, uh, well, one guy in particular would flip to the Iowa, whomever they were playing game. Ohio and, uh, State. <laughs> no, they weren't playing Ohio State, I don't believe. On Sunday? No, this was a couple of weekends ago. Oh, okay. I get you. <clears throat> I don't know who won or what was going on. I assume Iowa won, but I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. But, yeah. Uh, it was mentioned on our USC show last night when the two guys that I do the show with, uh, Tim and Matt, were ta- starting to talk USC uh, women's basketball and baseball that – that uh, some a number of people commented in the chat that Mark must be seething at this point. And that was probably for a 10th of the time here. This is the longest conversation, not football or major league baseball related in the history of the voice of college football. It has to be. And you also don't like, it's not like you have anything against women's basketball specifically. You don't like a lot of sports. You don't follow really anything other than college football anymore. Anymore. I don't. I love baseball, though. I, I've loved baseball my entire life. Oh, and I've loved the NFL my entire life. It's just I hasn't haven't followed it like I used to. So would you have are you a big enough baseball guy where you have would you have found a way over to Nolan Ryan? Or I'm not that kind to... of guy. OK. There used to I'm be not, those I mean... kind of, there, there used to be those kind of people down the hall at ESPN and that doesn't. Like if if I could genuinely have a conversation with Nolan Ryan, absolutely, I would love that. But just to be some guy like hi, he, no, <laughs> I'm not that guy. I used to hear that all the time at ESPN. Scotty Pippen's down the hall. Who cares? Like that's not a knock on Scotty Pippen, but I'm not going to have an, a basketball conversation with him and ask legitimate questions and talk to him. So I don't want to just stand there and say hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> By the way, USC has got a pretty good player in themselves and Juju Watkins. Yes. Uh, she was brought up yep. and that she's a freshman. And so our guy, Matt, is very confident that uh, she will be in the Caitlin Clark range by the time she plays out her career. And she could be. She's here for there for four years. Uh, she, she's I, I haven't watched her a lot, but I went back and watched some highlights of her. She's impressive. You know, Caitlin has changed the way the game is played and. I can see a lot. I'm not saying that Juju has completely emulated Caitlin Clark, but you think about it like Caitlin was doing this as a freshman and sophomore when Juju was just entering high school. So it's like those are the players that a lot of these younger players are going to be looking up to and emulating after. So having never seen Caitlin Clark shoot a basketball, let alone play a game, when you say change the game by doing what? She's shooting from the okay. logo. Routine. She's having like a Steph Curry impact oh. on the game. At 100%. Yeah. And she's got, you know, think about Caitlin. She's got unbelievable vision, um, unbelievable passing skills. She's very much like she's doing to, to women's college basketball what Steph Curry did to the NBA, you know, just in changing how the game is played and stretching out the floor. And, you know, so, so many of the shots she takes as I'm watching, I will actually say, oh, as she shoots, I'm like, a terrible shot. And then it goes in and you're like, well, okay, <laughs> what do you do? I don't, I don't know what to do here. Um, because I'm not saying like I again I've watched countless Iowa men's basketball games. There's nobody. Jordan Bohannon had good range, but there's nobody that I've ever seen at Iowa that has anything close to the range of Caitlin Clark, and that's that's impressive to me. Well, I understand the standard for a women's player making baskets is different. Don't they play with a smaller ball? It's easier to make a basket. Yeah, They're but shooting not, a smaller ball into the same size basket. Well, but I'm just, what's that got? To, I mean, what's that got to do with? It's easier to to make a basket. Okay, but we're still talking about I mean, we're talking about distances. So if we're talking about comparing a, a 
players from the three point arc or from the free throw line. It's the same discussion. There's no, no other. Yes. If you and I were going to go outside and you were going to play with a regulation basketball and I was going to play with a tennis ball and we were going to take a free throw shooting contest, I would have a major advantage because I would get <laughs> I yeah, would well, have so much. It would be so much easier for me to make a basket. Yes, but that's a little bit of an erroneous illustration because the women's basketball is 28 and a half inches. The men's basketball, I think, is 30. It's not like it's some huge well, difference. It, yes, there yeah, is. It was difference. made different for a reason. Right. But I'm just saying it's so they not, can handle the ball. It's not like throwing a baseball versus throwing a softball or throwing a or a throwing a basketball. But there was a reason that they made a basketball sure. different for the women's game. And what was the reason, Mark? Because their hands are smaller, I assume. Mm, well. Nevertheless. So they could handle right. the ball. Yeah. Well, all I know is what what uh, what Steph Curry has done for the men's game had never really been done as far as that. I mean, people in Michael Jordan's day weren't shooting from, you know, 30, 35 feet on routinely. No. And, uh, you know, guys, you, now it's Steph Curry, Dame Lillard, um, you know, go down the list. Trey Young, Luka Doncic, you know, steps back and hits deep shots a lot. Um, so anyways, uh, I've seen Juju do that a little bit, but I, I'd never seen it before Caitlin Clark. I just, I'd never seen it. And, uh, so it's, it's definitely generational. All right, folks. Appreciate you being here. Hawkeyes live. And, uh, we're going to get to the football right now in the NFL combine concluded this weekend in Indianapolis. And I told Corey before we came on that I saw less of the NFL combine than I've seen since who knows when. So I didn't see much of it and nothing really stood out to me. I, I heard bits and pieces from here and there about certain position groups and certain players. And one portion of this makes me question the whole process. And that's the whole, it's not, that these players anymore show up and then perform. It's that there's this buildup and this preparation to perform by training with track athletes, track coaches, doing all the things to kind of artificially hone their measurements toward this competition. And I kind of, I, I understand it from the standpoint that we're maxing out, we're, we're getting a look at how good these athletes can be at their maximum when they train at a particular function, sport, activity, that they can be this good. But what does that really pertain to playing football? So uh, I heard a few discussions this weekend about it possibly being a bit overrated. That said, Logan Lee, uh, Corey sent me some numbers concerning Logan Lee's performance. And... Um, when you put it all together, there's a statistical ranking of relative athletic score. And we've had our discussions and debates here in recent weeks about athleticism. Well, this is sheer athleticism uh, ranking and measurement and evaluation. And ranking number 238 out of 1,620 defensive tackles. That's top 15% during the course of the entire combine going back to whatever year is pretty darn impressive. 1987. 1987. I'm sorry. 1987. Yeah. 1987. And what's interesting is you look at his, his RAS, which again is that relative athletic score. His worst performance was simply on weight. So he was, he was graded out at 281. Um, you know, he's got good length at six, five and a quarter, but you know, I don't, I'm assuming that they, you know, to play on the interior at the next level, they want you closer to 300. I don't know if his frame, you know, how much weight can he put on once he gets to the NFL? I was surprised by these numbers in general. Like he, he tested great as it relates to explosion, his vertical, his broad jump. He was solid with his uh, 40 yard dash, his 20 yard split, his 10 yard split. So um, I'm surprised by that. And I don't know where that will end up uh, putting him as far as the rest of the class, but he scored an unofficial 8.54 as it relates to uh, total uh, relative athletic score. So that's, that's really good. And um, he's not a guy that many people had on their radar as it relates to, I, I mean, I, I don't know that he was ever a guy that I thought, Hey, he's going to get drafted 
top four or five. And maybe he won't get drafted in the top four or five rounds uh, with this. But, I mean, I'd have to think he gets drafted now. I mean, he's a multi-year starter at Iowa. Obviously a real good leader. He's going to test out with flying colors as it relates to character and interviews. He's married. He's a he's a high character, high um, high motor guy on the field, and as are most Iowa defensive linemen. And again, you talk about the the intangibles. Um, I would guess he gets a late flyer, and you pair that with some of the guys that, that we expect to to go, including Cooper DeGene. I was set to probably have another really solid year in the draft, in spite of returning all these guys, and several of which would have been drafted had they left. Who else was there from the Hawkeyes? I guess I should know this off the top of my head. Everyone you mention, I'm going to know, but I just can't collect the number of, what do we have, like five to eight players, I would guess, from well, Iowa? Cooper, yeah, Cooper did not compete because of his injury. He He's interviewing with teams and, and going through that process, but did not compete at the combine. I don't know who the other uh, players are. Let me, uh, let me look this up here because I'm – just trying to run through the gamut of people who are who have moved on. Like uh, Joe is another one. What's that? Joe Evans. Um, you know, I don't know that Joe Evans got invited. I know Tory Taylor did, and Eric All. Um, but I don't know that it was. Maybe it was just those four. So we got what did we say? Cooper DeGene was invited, did not go. Logan Lee, Tory Taylor, Eric All. I don't remember seeing uh, Joe Evans' name on that list. And I've not heard how those other guys have done. So I don't know. You know, Joe Evans is a guy who I wonder what his future is. If it's in football, what is it? Because he is really undersized. Parker Hesse was a little bit undersized. He ended up being converted to tight end and has actually made a nice little living with the Falcons as a tight end. It's a pretty incredible story. I don't know that Joe Evans quite has the uh, height for that. I don't know that he's got the feet for that or the hands for that. Um, you know, maybe he ends up being kind of a pass rushing linebacker type. Um, he's a former quarterback at the high school level. Obviously you talk about motor. He's the epitome of having a good motor, but, uh, you know, he's a guy, he's the type of guy who I would expect not to be drafted, but will absolutely get a shot in a camp. And he'd be one of the first, I'm, I'm biased of course, but he'd be one of the first guys. If I'm a, a scout or a, a, a team admin that, Hey, I'm, I'm calling this guy up, seeing if I can get him to camp because, um, uh, He's probably, even if he was invited to the combine, he's going to test out better on the field than he would with the metrics. That's kind of what I expected Logan Lee to do, but the fact that he tested out so well, graded out so well at the combine, that's just the cherry on top. That's I'd be surprised, really surprised he doesn't get drafted. And I don't know as far as Eric All, you know, he's coming off an injury as well. So um, you know, I've been so locked into to, uh, to basketball, I, I really, I, I didn't watch any of the combine, to be quite honest. Um, followed some of what, what happened with Logan Lee just through social media. But uh, I did see that Iowa state was the only, they only had one player to go to the combine from the Cyclones. That was TJ Tampa. And by the way, Mark, have we addressed Nate Schilhouse leaving Iowa state for the Rams? That's something that I don't think we've discussed on here, but he was a guy that we had tossed out as a potential name for the Iowa OC job. He's his dad played at Iowa and kind of an interesting decision to move his family to LA. I know he's got two little kids. Um, you know, I'm not questioning the decision making. I'm just saying, like, you know, he's only been the OC at Iowa State for one year. And he's got some little kids, um, young family. He's a Midwest guy. I was just a little surprised by that move. Well, first of all, this is the first time hearing of this. But my initial reaction is most of these guys are making career decisions. I think a little bit later they tend to make, and again, I'm speaking in volume, tend to make family-oriented decisions. But when you're the offensive coordinator at Iowa State and the Los Angeles Rams call. But he's not the OC for the Rams. Oh, okay. Okay. He's, uh, I believe he's passing game coordinator. Still. So I don't know. I, I'd like to know what, what he's getting paid to jump there. Because, I mean, money out there, m money in L.A. is not the same as money in Ames. Yeah. And, and again, the, the fact, I know what you're talking about, the career choice. I, I'm not saying, I'm not judging him for it. I'm just saying, like, yeah, he's got a young family. So, 
Yes, it's a different lifestyle. That is for sure. And that having never been to Iowa myself, but just knowing I, I, I have an idea of what we're talking about, having been to Southern California many times, but not to Iowa. I know you probably don't want to address this, Mark, but can I just address Sonny's, Sonny Verma's comment in the chat? He says, keep in mind there was no three-pointer during Pete Maravich's time, which is a substantial portion of Caitlin Clark's points. Yes, that is a fact. However, Pete Maravich also jacked up a ton more shots than Caitlin Clark does per game. A lot more shots per game. So volume-wise, it was not even close. And they also play different sports. Yeah, but I'm just saying if we, that's... <laughs> Yes, they they do play different sports, but I'm saying if we're going to have the conversation, let's not try to discredit Caitlin Clark's numbers by saying, well, Pistol Pete didn't have the three-point line. Yes, that's true, but let's then let's also talk about volume and, you know, everything was different back then. Yeah, her not numbers only her numbers are credible, otherworldly, impressive, all those all those superlatives because of what she has done against her peers that nobody else has ever done in a game that's been played for 50 some years. As far right. as and I know, I think early seventies women's college yeah. basketball and the way she's done it. I mean, it's totally different than how someone like Kelsey Plum at Washington did it. No, no, nothing against Kelsey Plum, but you know, she recently surpassed Kelsey, but Caitlin has changed the game on a number of levels. I, I'm not really into the whole, uh, I think it's ridiculous that that uh, Fox made this big deal about her passing Kelsey Plum's NCAA record when you have a gal by the name of Lynette Woodard who played at Kansas before the NCAA recognized Kansas as an NCAA institution. And Lynette Woodard had scored far more points than Kelsey Plum. Caitlin just passed Lynette Woodard the other day, and Iowa honored Lynette at the game, but like the NCAA won't recognize her points. And it's it's sort of sad because now she's been passed up. But, you know, you make this big deal about uh, Kelsey Plum and there's not really any reason that it's it's hard to even find a reason as to why the NCAA will not honor Lynette Woodard's numbers. So. Just add it to your list of NCAA gripes that you have. Yes. And Hummus Hero. Says that well, it takes more attempts to reach the same amount of points without the three pointer. That's why I'm. That's what I'm talking about. If we if we want to have that conversation, you can't use that on uh, to discredit an accomplishment. If anything, it ignites more of an equalizing conversation. That's the point. No one's saying one accomplishment's better than the other. As Mark said, different sports. But if we're going to have the conversation interlinking the sports, we can do that. And I guess to be more accurate, because somebody could quickly come back and say, well, it's the same sport. It's basketball. Yes. But by my definition or my intention of applying that term, it would be like comparing high school basketball players to college basketball players and looking at the records and making a comparison. Mark, as you as you uh, get prepped for our tight end onslaught, I got to remove myself from the stream for sure. All right, folks, appreciate you being here with the Voice of College Football. Get to the chat here, Mark. Let's see what's going on because we will talk tight ends. Uh, we knocked out the secondary with Corey last week, so check it out. We want to get to all the positions as we get into spring practice and didn't see anything else on the Iowa football beat that we needed to hit besides the NFL Combine and Logan Lee's performance, which is truly extraordinary if you look at the athleticism that he displayed. Going back to 1987, to be in the top 15% of all defensive tackles measured athletically, that's crazy. Corey is probably glad that he made it back before I was going to address Hummus Hero coming back with crunching the numbers and you got to crunch the numbers and I was going to make my two cents. But oh again, I just choose not to compare male and female athletes for obvious reasons. I, I think no let, me just say, let me just say this. You deal with the same thing with Michigan fans all the time being an Ohio State guy. My guess is there's a reason why it's, it's an Ohio State fan making that comment in the chat. I'll just leave it at that. It might be, but we don't know. Well, I think it's probable. Because think it's probable. of the 
well, there's no basketball rivalry between the two. They just had one little skirmish there at midcourt. No, no, no. This is, but Ohio State and Iowa are the two top teams in the conference. Oh. And there are, there are, there have been some, there's been some bad blood between the two schools. So since we're there's all over a- the place with these discussions and you brought up Michigan fans, I'm, I'm going to give my latest gripe yes. uh, against a particular fan because, because this, this just, I'm not going to name the fan. But you can find it on my I know, comments I, section. I know who the fan is. <laughs> <laughs> this is so incredibly stupid. It is unimaginable for me to even put it into words. So I the, the better word is moronic. Moronic. Don't you like that word more. Yeah. More. Lies. It's beyond moronic behavior and in thinking. So I truly approach the videos, the content, everything, the analysis as best I can with an unbiased perspective, as best I possibly can. We are currently looking at Big Ten television rankings, ratings and the viewership and then ranking. We looked at both the Big Ten against the other conferences, and now we're looking at the Big Ten teams against each other. Okay. I thought it would be most fair to take non-conference games out of the mix because Ohio State's off playing a Notre Dame in front of 10 million people and somebody else is playing somebody in front of 400,000 people and to try to weigh all that out. Let's look at partic- in particular Ohio State and Michigan. They both played nine conference games. They played eight of the exact same opponents. Eight out of the nine. The only difference was Michigan played Nebraska and Ohio State played Wisconsin. And if you look at the other numbers, if anything, Nebraska was a little bit better draw than Wisconsin, but it was roughly the same. Yep. They both played on network television, ABC game for Michigan and Nebraska, a CBS game for uh, Ohio State and Wisconsin. So basically, they're playing the same schedule. Okay. Ohio State played one game on Peacock. So all nine Michigan games were on network television. So those could be tabulated but there was one game that ohio state played against purdue on peacock so that game i could not include did not have numbers for the peacock games so ohio state had more total viewership in eight games than michigan had in nine games there is no way for me to cook the books stretch numbers manipulate anything i just laid out the numbers that's all i simply did I had a moronic Michigan fan who stated, Mark, you do this all the time. You you delete information and you uh, fail to uh, add information that would uh, truly put this into context so that you can just manipulate it the way you want to make Ohio State look good and keep Michigan down. You moron. If I included <laughs> the Ohio State-Purdue game and I said they – had zero viewers. Let's say nobody <laughs> watched. I know that I watched, but let's say they had zero viewers. Do you realize that Ohio State would still have more viewers for their nine conference games <laughs> than Michigan did? You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me that it's not possible that Ohio State could have had negative viewers for the Peacock game? <laughs> yeah, people were... were I don't know how I was trying how to have some way to possibly make that a thing. Negative viewers. And Uh, and that's just an example of just people just don't be offended by your team not being number one at something. It's 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 okay. Think about how think about what a pathetic complex that displays for. And it's not all Michigan fans, but when you have responses like that, what what complex that paints, you're coming off a national championship. And you still feel the need to get defensive about something like that. That is just factual information, right? Um, and I've never seen you tout Ohio State. You're just like you said, you lay out the, the you have your opinions on things, but you lay it out based on the numbers. I just like it's unbelievable to me that Michigan, I, I still believe and I know a lot of Michigan fans aren't going to like this, but I still believe there are a lot of Michigan Wolverine fans. Who have still not gotten past the dominance that Ohio state had over your program for a good stretch of this century. 
And I, I, although Michigan now has owned that rivalry for several years, and now they're national champions, and they've been to a couple of playoffs, I still don't think that's out of their system. I really don't. It's going to take a good amount of time before they finally get that out of their system. Because a lot of these young guys who are, you know, probably commenting these things, that's what they grew up watching. They grew up watching their their team look like a poverty program in comparison to the Buckeyes. So, and I, and I think too, here's the thing. We have seen so little as far as uh, indication or signs that Ohio State is nearing anything that would even resemble a return or a, a, a regression to what Michigan was 10 years ago, right? Like even though Michigan owns this conference right now and winning that series, Ohio State's still rattling off 11 games a year. You know, like when Michigan was down, they weren't doing that, right? But I'm talking like the Brady Hoke years and Rich Rod and all that crap. So I, I do believe there is a complex there. So it's it's quite amusing. I saw a, a tweet by a Michigan outlet today that basically said something about how how it's going to completely ruin Ohio State's uh, fans' uh, morale when J.J. McCarthy is a top five pick in the NFL draft. I'm like, did anybody ever hear about C.J. Stroud last cares? year? Did, did, does anybody know what C.J. Stroud has done in the NFL <laughs> one year in? And does does anybody know where? Does anybody know that Justin Fields was a, a first round, a first round draft pick here a couple of years ago? And I mean, are we familiar with that? Do we? I mean, does it ruin your day, Corey, when a Nebraska, Wisconsin, or Minnesota player is drafted in the top ten in the NFL draft? What difference does? Yeah, like, yeah, it ruined my day when I had to watch Brock Purdy go to the Super Bowl. That ruined my whole year. Iowa State quarterback that was Mr. Irrelevant ended up in the Super Bowl. No, it's I don't care. I'm happy for him. Happy for yeah. him. Um, you want we want to talk tight ends, Mark? Yes, we should get to the tight ends. We're going to talk Iowa football, folks. Here we go. If anyone out there does not believe that this is tight end, you please include that in the chat, and we'll be kind to you. But I'm just curious if there's anyone that has a defense for anyone else, and of course. The, the crowd is leaning black and gold, of course, but we know that we've got other fans here. So I'm just curious because I think we've arrived at a place when looking at the last 15 years to 20 years of college and NFL football that it's not debatable. So we will see here with Luke Lachey getting injured last year, catching about, let's see, only uh, 10 passes for him as Addison Estrenga took over uh, the starting position, caught 31 balls. Interesting number here. I'm a stats nerd. 6.2 yards per reception for Addison Estrenga. And I'm not faulting him for that. He caught the passes, but that is an extremely low figure in terms of downfield stretching the field at the, the tight end position or really any yards per catch uh, performance out of any offensive player. So we've got Luke Lachey, Addison Estrenga, Zach Ortworth, who else would be in the mix in regards to those that could possibly see meaningful snaps? Uh, well, I'll be anxious to see what uh, the progression for Grant Leaper looks like. Gavin Hoffman is as high of a recruit uh, at tight end as we've seen in recent years. He's there early, so he's part of uh, winter conditioning now and spring practice here starting in a couple of weeks. So those are guys I'm looking for. I got a lot of uh, interest in watching what Grant Leaper does. Cause I think, you know, he's a former gray shirt kid who I thought was heavily under recruited, had an opportunity to, I believe walk on at Indiana ends up getting a gray shirt to go to Iowa is now on scholarship. Physically looks the part kind of like a stringa did, you know, a stringa was like, I want to say he was not even top 1200 nationally in the country. And he was playing as a freshman. Uh, and you're right. That those, that reception per that yard per reception number is very low, but, take into account the Iowa offense and quarterback play and play calling all that. I mean, it's obviously it wasn't an Addison, a string of problem. This makes me want to watch. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not in any way dissing uh, his performance. It just hit me because usually that number's in the 10 to 12 range for a tight end. And that makes me want to someday when we've got the staff to do this. Hey, Jimmy, 
go cut up all of Adam Addison Estranga's 31 receptions from last. I want to see all of them. I want to see those 31 plays. I would love that. That'd be the kind of stuff people would eat alive here. If you had somebody that could just go through and just, if we break down players, we just play clips. Yes. Based on what we just mentioned there, man, it's strange. 6.2 yards per reception. Okay, let's roll them. 31 receptions. Let's take a look. Yeah. He's a, a Stringa had a couple. I want to say it was, was it the not Wisconsin game? Might have been Minnesota. One of those games late in the year where he made a couple of really impressive catches along the sidelines. Um, he got better as the year went on. And obviously he was thrust into a role where he was a, a much needed outlet for a, a pass offense that really couldn't get anything going without uh, Eric all and Luke Lachey. Um, a receiver play was just qu quite frankly bad and quarterback play was bad. So no, I mean, I think that the list that Andy posted there in the chat, Lachey, Estringa, um, you know, Pascuzzi is a walk on, but he's, he's played a lot. Zach Ortworth was a freshman last year, played more than I expected, made a big play in, in a game on a go route. Uh, so yeah, those four guys I would think would figure in to the mix. I think when you when we talked, you and I talked yesterday about you know what uh, position where we're going to look at. One of my thoughts, not only about Gavin Hoffman, is where how quickly does he get up to speed? Because we've seen tight ends like Sam Laporta, like Addison Estringa play early in their careers, like T.J. Hawkinson. But then my other question is Michael Burt, really talented kid. I think he was very much like Grant Leaper, very under recruited, had offers from like Minnesota and Nebraska and Illinois, some Big Ten schools, but a lot of FCS, FBS, uh, well, F F FCS group of five offers, I should say. Um, but he's going to be really good, too. He doesn't get there until uh, the summertime. He's at a Creighton prep in Omaha. So he's another guy that I think will figure into the mix. I wonder what the future is like for Kale Vanderbush. And um, heard some speculation on that front, but he's a, a guy that came in, same classes. Addison Estringa, I'm not aware of him seeing the field. Maybe he's seen the field a little bit on special teams, but um, you know now he's going into his third year. Uh, he's a redshirt sophomore, and you know a six foot four, two twenty five. Do we potentially see him at some point moving to a different position? I don't know. Um, remember, they also need to trim down the guys of, that are on scholarship to get back to the eighty five limit. So. Uh, yeah, those are my question marks. I mean, uh, they brought in uh, Jalen Thompson. Uh, he's a redshirt freshman at a uh, West Des Moines Do Dowling who will be walking. It was who's a walk on on the roster. Andrew Lynch is another walk on. They've had guys who have emerged. Uh, Hayden Large is still listed as a tight end, although he's a graduate and will be their fullback again. They've been playing less with the fullback, so you know maybe they get creative with him. Um, they got plenty of guys who can earn that role. Uh, but Luke Lachey is going to be the guy. I mean, there's no question he's going to be, and he should be. I mean, it was a great start to the year before getting injured in 2023. And with Eric all gone, there's no question he's the guy. And, you know, then you got a string in Ortworth and these guys learning behind him and um, see what the development's like for the other ones. I threw the bait out there for a reason. Uh, D-Rock Irish, Tyler Eifert, Kyle Rudolph, Anthony Fasano, Dave Casper, we're going back to like 1970 with that one. J Dave Casper's an all-time great, but still, we're stretching the years way out there. John Carlson, Mark Bavaro, some Notre Dame tight ends to the NFL, and D-Rock Irish, to be clear, you're not stating that necessarily to say that uh, Notre Dame is tight end you. Uh, maybe all-time, that would be a great debate, but certainly Iowa's got it, but Notre Dame, top five all-time. Question for you, Corey. So Luke Lachey in sharing time with uh, Sam Laporta and having that great combo in 2022 caught 28 balls, 398 yards, 14 yards per reception, four touchdowns. So from what you've seen out of Luke Lachey, is he as good as that legacy of tight end that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years? Is he in that category? I think so. I think so. Based on what I, I wasn't so sure of that before last year, what were his stats? I haven't looked at his stats through September of 2023 before he got hurt. Do you have those numbers? 10 passes, 131, no touchdowns. And he got hurt in game three. I think like before halftime of game three. So, uh, I mean, obviously volume was more, um, 
but he he looked the part. I mean, he just looked extremely reliable. I, I doubt he had more than I doubt he had more than two or three drops during that stretch of time. And um, you know, Sam Laporta is another guy. We, we talked about the combine earlier for Logan Lee. Laporta is another guy who tested very well at the NFL Combine, much to the surprise of some people. And I was surprised that Sam Laporta was not seen as a better draft prospect. And Mark, it's kind of like when we looked at the seven and five prediction from Vegas on Iowa a year ago, and we were both like, uh, okay, I guess these guys know more than we do, but this seems odd. And we were right. <laughs> we, we were We were right on that, and they blew that away with 10 wins. Honestly, it was the same case with Sam Laporta and and Jack Campbell, frankly. Like both those guys, I was like, hey, like Jack Campbell obviously was regarded slightly higher, but just the guy's work ethic, his physical uh, stature, the production that we saw of Sam Laporta. I mean, from a volume standpoint, Sam put up some of the best numbers we've ever seen at a tight end heavy at any school, let alone Iowa. And so we'll see if Lachey can stay healthy. I think that's going to be the key coming off that that uh, lower leg injury, but um, no, I think he's got a chance to be really good. And he's, as far as size is concerned, he's listed at six, six, two fifty three. No, he's, he looks the part physically. And um, you know, I don't know where he, I would have been curious to see where he would have been drafted had he left last year. Cause remember heading into the year, he was on a lot of preseason watch lists kind of being projected as a top, at least four or five tight end nationally. And if I remember correctly, Corey, the Zach Ortworth play, his one reception last year for 54 yards. If we listed, this would be another good May slash June category that go through, let's say, the top 10 plays, the 10 most meaningful, impactful plays for Iowa football last year. But if I recall, they're playing at Camp Randall. They're only, they win the game eventually 15 to 6. So they win by two scores, but they're up by one score. They're buried deep in their own end and they're about to have to punt. He makes the big play 54 yards, gets them past midfield. They kick a field goal that extends it out to a two score lead. So that was one of the bigger plays in what was at the time, the biggest game of the season. Probably overlooked too, because it ended in a field goal, <laughs> right? Like in general, there's a lot of plays that were like. How right? do I say this without knocking Iowa? No, isn't that apropos? Like if this was another yeah. team, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the block punt against Iowa State in 2022. They block a punt like first possession, first quarter of the game. I think it's first possession of the game for Iowa State. And, you know, then Arlen Bruce has this end around where he his feet come out from under him and he slips and falls and they have to settle for a field goal and end up losing the game. But that was an unbelievable play on the block pun. And you don't talk about it because it ended in a field goal and eventually a loss. Now they did win at Wisconsin. So you're right. And they had some big plays in the run game that propelled them. Remember they ran the ball pretty well against that Badger defense that day. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll be anxious to see what he did. I, I, he was not a kid. I'll openly admit that. I'm happy to admit that I was probably wrong on that. Zach Ortworth was not somebody I had pegged as a guy who I expected to come in and compete right away. Um, Addison Estringa was just physically his athleticism, his experience up at Sun Prairie, um, his hands, what he demonstrated on tape as it relates to route running. Um, I didn't expect as much out of Cale Vanderbush, but again, these guys are being recruited with a view to development. And I was of course been the best in the business at developing guys. TJ Hawkinson wasn't a real high Highly regarded kid. Either was George Kittle or um, either were George Kittle or, or Sam Laporta. So um, I'll be anxious to see what what Zach Ortworth looks like in year two. And um, you know, obviously, this is this is one of the easier conversations we're going to have when we're looking at positions because I mean, when's the last time Iowa has not had a strong tight end room? You know, they were they were decimated by injury last year. Um, you know, just unbelievably bad fortune to have two great players, probably your two best offensive players overall go down with season ending leg injuries. You know, you just can't draw that stuff up. And then your quarterback also goes down as kind of the cherry on top. So that, that hurt, no question about it. And so when Kirk talks about, you know, injuries hurting the offense, that's absolutely true. 
the injuries that they had last year at quarterback and the two tight end positions were arguably the worst injuries for Iowa to try to sustain. But part of the part of the reason they were so uh, devastating is because of the lack of development that has been had at the rest of the op- with the rest of the offense, including backup quarterback positions, O line, everything else, wide receiver. So they're very reliant on uh, a quarterback that can get the tight end the ball and the you know their best players being tight ends. And in yeah, spite of the tight end play, they still have put up miserable numbers offensively. Exactly. And so I kind of chuckle when you say that, because I completely agree with you. If somebody would have said in August, Cade McNamara is going to get hurt the second or third game of the season, something in that range. And they're going to lose their two tight ends who, as you state, are probably the two best offensive players and weapons. Now we're going to look at their offensive stats. Do you think that they are skewed in any way? I would have said, well, absolutely. They lost those players, but it just kind of fell in line with their previous offensive performances. So it was kind of strange in that there's no excuse on one hand, because that was the norm before that. But at the same time, we should offer some concession to you lose your starting quarterback. You lose your two best weapons. And and keep in mind, they got Cade McNamara out of the portal because they couldn't develop quarterbacks at Iowa. Right? Like, they didn't have good quarterback play, so they went and got somebody that had suffered a serious injury but was far better as it relates to to uh, potential than any of the guys that were on the, the roster. And that is, that is of course, that goes back to Brian Ferentz and the failures of quarterback development and I think the hiring pro- – the promotion process of Brian Ferentz. So um, hopefully with Tim Lester, now you're, you're going to see some younger guys developed. I had a conversation – I don't think Don would mind me bringing this up. I, I did have a conversation with Don – after the game in Iowa city on Sunday. And I asked him, I said, coach, who do you think uh, if, if Tim Lester gets his say, who do you think the, the starting quarterback during the spring will be? Cause remember Kate is not expected to be full go. I know he's working out with, with his guys, but he's not going to be full go in pads. So um, yeah, that's my question. What, who do you think Tim Lester would prefer? And of course, Don has not had a conversation with Tim about this, but his first reaction would be Marco Linez because of Marco's ability to, run his athleticism um you know deacon one of the big things we kept hearing about deacon was that he was going to lose weight in the offseason i don't know that he's done that maybe he has see what he's listed at right now Uh, not to switch this over to quarterback discussion but deacon hill is listed at he's (laughs) he's still listed at 258 now maybe they've not weighed guys recently is that possible mark we're we're going to give them the better we're going to give him the benefit of the doubt 258. Yeah. What, what would you, let's see, 2023. Let me see if that's different than he, what he was listed at last year. 258. Did, yeah, no, he was 258 last year. So maybe they haven't updated this. I think there's a probably a good chance they haven't updated this. I'm just curious to see if they've updated anybody else. So like um, last year, Linez was 225. McNamara was 205. My guess is those are the same. Let's see. So far, two hundred five and yeah, two twenty five. So my guess they have not they have not updated those. I would think we'd get an update on on height and weight during the spring. Weight is a little sensitive topic for me right now because I've always lived in that place where oh, I eat whatever I want. I don't gain any weight. This is just how I live my life and so forth. And I bought some batteries for a scale the other day, and I went, really. You know what it is? Seriously? It's all those Oreos. And did you oh, know? Of course, I've been eating those forever. But did you know that? Let's see. Is it tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow is National Oreo Day. National Oreo Cookie Day. So this pretty much forces me to go buy some Oreos. Absolutely. I I'm have sure to. That if you, I don't know what restaurants there are, but I'm sure some of these fast food restaurants that have blizzards and concrete mixers and what do they call them at uh, McFlurry's at McDonald's. I'm sure somebody's give, doing some promotion from Oreos tomorrow. I'll have to look out for that. I had some Oreo cream pie the other day. That sounds good. You ever had yeah. the you ever had the uh, Oreo ice cream bars? Yes. Those are probably not very good for you, but <laughs> they are tasty. 
Where do you buy them? Do you buy the, them? At, the problem uh, is the volume of what I eat. That's the issue. Yes. I was on a Chips Ahoy kick this week and I polished off a couple bags. Soft or crunchy? I went for the crunchy. Yep. I can go either route. I can't do soft. I just, they taste, they taste uh, fake to me. But yeah. I can do crunchy all day long. Yeah, with some milk. Absolutely. All right. You were all set for the tight ends, folks. How about that? Head on over to uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm this week for Corey's uh, rundown, men's, women's basketball. Uh, where do we stand on the games this week and post game? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have post game coverage for Iowa women's basketball. They'll get a double buy, so they won't play till Friday. We'll have post game coverage for that. Of course, most of the tournaments on Big Ten Network and then Sunday, the finals are on CBS. Uh, so we'll have post game coverage throughout all of women's basketball this weekend. And then on Sunday, the Iowa men play their regular season finale against Illinois. Big game tonight. I know it was mentioned earlier by T. Hink in the chat. Illinois Purdue men's basketball on Peacock. It's a big game because if if Purdue wins, then Illinois is out of the Big Ten race, which would mean the game on Sunday against Iowa could mean less, maybe less of a motivation to win if you're Illinois. So if you're an Iowa fan, you're probably rooting for Purdue to win because you don't want them playing for a Big Ten title on Sunday against Iowa. This is how my mind works. When, as soon as you said Illinois Purdue, I thought if I had the time, and I won't do this, I always think like this, but I never follow up on it. I would run to YouTube and say, you know what I'm going to do for a couple hours? I'm going to watch the Illinois Purdue game from last year, the football game. I'm never going to do that. But if I had limitless time, I would do things like that. It's a pretty big, I mean, I know you've got other stuff to do and you've got other shows to do, but that game starts, that's a pretty good big game. I mean, it's top two teams in the Big Ten. Is there any chance you turn that on tonight? I haven't watched a college basketball game in like 12 years. Okay. Uh, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> well, that's not entirely. I've had the NCAA tournament running in front of me without really knowing what's going on or who's playing or who's who kind of thing for, you know, I'll, I'll do that during March Madness. But I, I do or did enjoy the sport at one time, but no, I will not be watching Illinois and Purdue play basketball tonight. You have Peacock? Mm, no. Really? But you get I it. ordered it for football season, then canceled. Okay. All right, everyone. Appreciate you being here. Make it on back next Tuesday. In the meantime, lock in with Corey on from the Hawkeye of the Storm, and we'll see you next week.